Okay, good afternoon, dear participants and speakers. Welcome to the session of the sixth annual Life in Kyrgyzstan conference on sustainable agriculture, food security, and food system in Central Asia. So this is a very important topic because uh, food is the main source of all of us. And uh, the country's development depends a lot uh, on the food system. That's why the food security uh, is a critical issue in many parts of the world. So in many countries, people are facing a food crisis and uh, its negative aspects are bad for the economic growth. Food is also a basic element of households because it provides jobs, employment, uh, and uh, <coughs> it enables, enables community and supports public health. As you know, uh, good food is the base of uh, health and thus not nutrition is tried, uh, tied uh, too much to health. And the causes of that and disability in our society uh, can be affected by healthy eating choices and lifestyles. So the topics of three presenters are very interesting and it gives great pleasure to listen to them. So my name is Kadrbek Sultakeyev and I am a mod moderator of this session. Uh, let me inform you that you have three speakers, uh, three presenters uh, and each speaker has 20 minutes for the presentation and 10 minutes for discussion. I will remind you when you have five minutes uh, and one minute left, I will ask uh, attendees to send their question using the, using, uh, the Q and A function in Zoom and then uh, it will be responded at the end of the talk. So hopefully we will have a good internet connection during the whole session uh, now I will introduce the first presenter. So we are pleased to welcome Abdul Samir Tajiv. Uh, he studied agricultural economics at Samarkand University in Uzbekistan. And currently he is, uh, he is a PhD student at YAMO. Uh, he is doing his PhD under uh, the supervision of Dr. Nadir, Nadir Johnny Beck and Professor Thomas Hersfeld. Uh, both are from IMO. And his research interests are land and water reforms, uh, technology adoption in agriculture, and farm behavior. And now uh, he will be pre presenting on the topic determinants of sustain sustainable agriculture uh, practices in Central Asia, empirical evidence from Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, the, the floor is yours, Abdul Sameh. You can start your presentation. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kaderbek, uh, for kind introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, present uh, my uh, uh, part of uh, PhD uh, topic in uh, the sixth uh, annual life uh, uh, in Kyrgyzstan conference. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, all attendance and participants to, uh, to attend our uh, session. Today, I will present about determinants of sustainable agriculture practice in Central Asia, empirical evidence from Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, this actually, this uh, 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 topic uh, is a part of my PhD thesis, and um, uh, I'm doing my PhD uh, in the framework uh, of Sosadika project. And this is a joint project with uh, IAMA in Germany and TIAM, which is the Tashkent Institute of Irrigation and Agriculture and Conservation Engineers in Uzbekistan. So co-authors, uh, the co-authors are Nod Dr. Nodar Jaribekev and Golu Sanayev. Sanayev both are uh, from IAMO in Germany. So uh, the outline of my presentation is following is, uh, firstly, I will tell about uh, problem background and research questions. Then I will continue by explaining about conceptual frameworks, data regions, and data description. Then I will tell about methodology that we use during our research. And finally, I will tell about the results and conclusions and policy implications. So uh, before beginning of my presentation, I would like to uh, tell uh, uh, about uh, sustainable agriculture practices. What is sustainable agriculture practice? So uh, sustainable agriculture practice can be defined as efficiently using of available res uh, resources on the aim of improving productivity. 
So uh, land uh, management technologies, uh, kind of crop rotation, uh, laser leveling, uh, or biomes improvement, crop diversification, or uh, conservation uh, uh, tillage, and uh, also water management technologies, kind of drip irrigation or sprinkler irrigation can be example uh, for sustainable agriculture practice. So adopting of sustainable agriculture uh, practices uh, usually produce economic advantages for farmers, at least at the this, the, the, the level. But uh, in the most developing countries, uh, including uh, Central Asian countries, uh, the, the increasing uh, land and water productivity and farm performance are the main uh, problems, are main issues. And uh, so after the call, uh, establishment of former Soviet Union, uh, land, uh, the using of land in extensively and intensively way, as well as after the collapse of uh, Soviet Union, uh, lack of land management system, uh, influence on land degradation in uh, all Central Asian countries. Uh, furthermore, the inefficiently uh, use of irrigation uh, led to uh, soil salinity and also water degradation problems. Uh, as well as in some part of uh, Central Asian countries, uh, they still use old established uh, machinery. Farmers use still old established machinery instead of new um, technologies, new machineries, and all kind of these problems uh, influence uh, of uh, uh, land and water degradation. As well as they are influenced uh, as a result, they influence the decreasing of uh, crop yields and farm income. Uh, therefore, we assume that adoption of sustainable agriculture practice can be one of the uh, options to uh, resolve uh, such problems. For instance, the adoption of conservation agriculture uh, may combat uh, land uh, soil salinity, soil erosion problem, and uh, adopting of conservation uh, agriculture may improve uh, land uh, quality. And, uh, also, adoption of water management technologies, kind of drip irrigation or speaker irrigation, also may improve, uh, uh, may combat water degradation problems. And uh, as well as uh, uh, adopt uh, using of sustainable crop rotation uh, will improve crop yields and uh, also will increase uh, land quality. So, uh, in such kind of Technologies, uh, practices uh, actually have been tested in uh, Central Asian countries and they demonstrated economic feasibility. But despite uh, they demonstrate economic feasibility, adoption level of uh, among farmers of these technologies are still low. It can be explained uh, that several factors may uh, um, uh, impact on uh, adoption decision. Therefore, in our research, uh, we are going to answer two main questions. So, first of all, we are going to test uh, how are the behavioral factors, social norms, and institutional settings related to farmers' decision to adopt sustainable agriculture practices. And secondly, uh, we are going to uh, better understand which factors prevent or facilitate farmers' adoption of sustainable agriculture practice. So, to, in our research, we conceptualize that farmers' decision. Uh, about sustainable agriculture uh, practice adoption uh, can be related with several factors. For instance, socioeconomic factors. In our research, we are going to test uh, the education of farmers, the age and ex uh, farmers' experience in farm site. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the adoption decision can be related to institutional factors. In our case, institutional factors can be land tenure security or uh, freedom of decision making and uh, credit availability. And also, uh, social, uh, we are going to measure social, the impact of social, uh, social networks. So in our case, social networks are uh, information source and relatives as farmers. And uh, we are all, also going to measure location factors. So location factors are located distance to market and distance to city center. And finally, uh, we are going to measure the uh, farmers' behavior factors. Uh, uh, and in all cases, farmers' behavior factors uh, are uh, farmers' risk preference and time preference, as well as social norms and uh, participating cooperation. Uh, our research uh, is based on farm survey data. Farm survey data was uh, conducted, uh, collected from uh, six districts of uh, two, uh, 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 two provinces of two countries in Central Asia. 
uh, which is uh, Samarkand province from Uzbekistan and Turkestan province from Kazakhstan. And uh, this, this farm survey data was conducted, uh, uh, were, con were conducted in the framework AgriChange project. AgriChange, which is an essential change in land and labor relations of Central Asian as irrigate agriculture project uh, from March to April uh, in 2019. And totally, uh, uh, 963 uh, farmers were participated in the survey. Uh, out of these, uh, 406 farmers from Uzbekistan and 503 uh, farmers from Kazakhstan. Uh, and why we choose these two uh, uh, regions? Uh, uh, in this uh, table, given the main uh, factors, uh, uh, relevant factors uh, of uh, these two regions. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, first of all, we should, we should say that both countries are former Soviet Union countries. And secondly, after the uh, independence, both countries uh, actively introduce uh, reforms in agriculture sector. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they uh, collective farmers, uh, former collective farmers and state farmers shifted into individual uh, private uh, farmers. And uh, however, the land uh, distribution uh, was a bit dis uh, have a difference between two countries. In Kazakhstan, I average cotton, uh, mainly in Turkestan province, uh, average cotton farm area ha has six hectares. But in uh, Samarkand, uh, uh, cotton area uh, is larger in comparing to Turkestan. So uh, uh, cotton farm has about average nine hectare land uh, area in Samarkand. Furthermore, Uzbekistan uh, introduced uh, some uh, farm consolidation reform in 2008 and 2019, as well as since 2018, uh, cotton cultivation transferred to private textile companies called clusters in, uh, in Uzbekistan. In both countries, cotton, uh, uh, both province cotton is, has been the main uh, crop. Uh, but, but however, in Kazakhstan, uh, cotton production has been more liberal comparing to Uzbekistan. In, in Uzbekistan, in, in Samarkand province, cotton uh, and wheat uh, have been uh, state crops. So they are the, the main relevant factors of two, two regions. So in this survey, uh, farmers uh, were asked if they uh, adopt uh, uh, one of the following uh, technologies, agriculture technologies, uh, and the uh, results show that uh, in both countries, uh, farmers are mostly uh, used uh, three uh, technologies, which are crop rotate, uh, rotation, biological pest control methods, and uh, low tillage of land, and comparing to other technologies. And in the survey, uh, in, the, in our research, we uh, divided farmers into two groups, uh, which are adopters and non-adopters. Adopter groups mean that if farmers uh, use at least uh, uh, one of the follow, at least uh, use one of the following uh, uh, low costly technologies, we assume that crop rotation, biological pest control methods, low tillage of land and direct planting without tillage or intercropping, uh, are the are low uh, costly technologies comparing to other technologies, and uh, uh, as well as uh, in for both countries, uh, other technologies is uh, um, least used by farmers. So, and uh, we assume that uh, high costly technologies uh, can be related with financial risk. Uh, risk. So therefore, we excluded. Have high cost of technologies, kind of laser leveling of field, drip irrigation, spring irrigation, bio uh, home technologies. And the results show that uh, about uh, 33 farmers uh, in Kazakhstan adopt at least uh, one, one of the uh, least uh, costly technologies. Uh, but in Uzbekistan, it's uh, uh, higher than compared to Kazakhstan, so about 46 farmers. Uh, adopt at least one of the uh, low cost uh, technologies. And in this uh, table uh, explains the main uh, summary statistics of uh, some selected uh, variables. So uh, the analysis show that uh, uh, farm manager, manager experience, so education of farm manager, uh, as well as uh, participating tra training course are 
higher in adopter groups comparing to non-adopter groups in both countries. Uh, however, the land size is uh, smaller uh, for adopters compared to non-adopters uh, for both countries. And soil fertility also lower in adopter groups for both countries uh, compared to non-adopter groups. And uh, cooperation production, so participating uh, uh, cooperation is higher in adopter groups in Kazakhstan, however, in Uzbekistan is uh, uh, for adopter groups compared to non-adopter is uh, lower the participating of uh, uh, cooperation crop production. Also soil for, for uh, uh, sorry, also the number of uh, cultivated crops are also higher in Uzbekistan compared to Kazakhstan, but however, for adopter groups uh, uh, is lower in Kazakhstan, and but in uh, Uzbekistan adopter groups uh, produce uh, more crops compared to non-adopter groups. So there are the main uh, uh, description of some selected variables. And uh, actually uh, to uh, understand uh, the determinants uh, of uh, uh, SAF's adoption, sustainable agriculture practice adoption decision, we use a uh, uh, probit uh, model or econometric model. Uh, firstly, we measure SAP's adoption decision, uh, the, then uh, we separately measure the determinants of three mostly used sustainable agriculture uh, practices, which are uh, crop rotation, conservation tillage, and uh, biological pest control methods. In the, in the first model, if farmers adopt at least uh, one of the low cost uh, technologies, but in here, if farmers adopt uh, crop rotation, then one, there are the other ways, and the same calculation for other technologies also. So, totally four uh, we generate uh, four probit models, and we try to better understand the main drivers of uh, sustainable agriculture practice adoption decision. So, uh, the model results show that. Uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, farmers risk preferences uh, and caring opinion of uh, farmers and colleagues and also participating cooperation is, uh, uh, are the main uh, factors, main drivers that influence sustainable agriculture practice adoption, adoption decision. In contrast, in Uzbekistan, uh, farm, uh, educational farm manager in a number of cultivated crops uh, and also caring opinion of other farmers and colleagues are the uh, main factors of uh, sustainable agriculture practice adoption. And by the way, actually, we, uh, we try to measure uh, about 20 variables in the, for the reason of time limited, uh, I, would like, I decide to show main uh, uh, factors that influence the safe adoption decision. Uh, if it is separately that uh, uh, opinion of farmers and uh, caring opinion of other far, uh, farmers and colleagues uh, are the is the main uh, determinant uh, of uh, uh, crop rotation and biological methods for pest control adoption decision for Kazakhstan and as well as uh, uh, co participating in cooperation production uh, uh, also statistic statistically significant uh, uh, effect to. Uh, adoption decision of biological uh, methods uh, for pest control and uh, conservation tillage. Uh, in case of Uzbekistan, uh, crop rotation adoption and, and decision is related with uh, uh, cultivate uh, number of cultivated crops and farmers' risk preferences. And biological method for pest control is related with education uh, and also uh, opinion or caring opinion of other farmers and colleagues. In uh, co and cooperation, uh, participation, cooperation, crop production uh, is also related with conservation tillage in case of Uzbekistan. Additionally, uh, in uh, uh, participation uh, uh, training courses and land tenure security, as well as information source about new technologies and agronomy, is, uh, are the main drivers for. Uh, adoption decision for in both countries. Uh, however, uh, in contrast, uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, decision making freedom on uh, cultivating crop or on using crop rotation uh, is a, a main factor for 
uh, sustainable agriculture practice adoption decision, including crop rotation and biological methods for uh, pest control. Uh, in uh, in uh, Uzbekistan, um, uh, if farmers trust courts to assist, it is uh, uh, it is negatively and statistically significantly impact on SAP's adoption decision as well as biological methods for pest controls and conservation tillage. So, uh, uh, based on the result, we conclude that. Uh, uh, the, the results show that uh, farmers uh, who care about opinion of other farmers and relatives, they are more likely to adopt sustainable agriculture practice for both countries. And uh, education also one of the main factors to adopt sustainable agriculture practice. In case of Uzbekistan, so farmers with higher education, they are more likely to adopt uh, sustainable agriculture practice. But uh, in uh, uh, farmers in Kazakhstan, uh, higher education farmers uh, are less likely to adopt uh, crop rotation, for instance. And uh, the information, uh, uh, so, uh, information source of technology and ag agronomy uh, is the main factor for both countries. So if our uh, farmers uh, uh, receive information from their network, they are less likely to adopt sustainable agriculture practice. Uh, and also risk preference uh, uh, also significantly impact, uh, influence on adoption decisions. So risk taking farmers are more likely to adopt uh, crop rotation in Uzbekistan, uh, as well as uh, risk taking farmers are more likely to adopt biological methods in case of Kazakhstan. Uh, and uh, surprising, uh, surprisingly, so farmers who trust courts in uh, assets uh, uh, with local administration, they are uh, the farmers are less likely to adopt such an agriculture practice. In the case of Uzbekistan, it can be explained that uh, adoption uh, is not uh, uh, so adoption of sustainable agriculture practice are not voluntary in Uzbekistan. Therefore, if they trust the courts, they may least likely to adopt uh, sustainable agriculture practice. And uh, for both countries, so land tenure security is um, uh, main uh, detriment of SAP's adoption decision. So uh, the results show that uh, SAP's adoption is both against related to farmers' feeling about land tenure security. Uh, and for Kazakhstan, uh, farmers in Kazakhstan, uh, the uh, decision making, the freedom decision making on uh, crop cultivating and crop rotation is positively associated with as a sustainable agriculture practice adoption. In case of uh, uh, also participating uh, cooperation in crop production uh, uh, is also uh, uh, significantly influence on sustainable agriculture practice adoption decision. So farm, uh, farmers who cooperate in agriculture production, they are more likely to adopt sustainable agriculture practice. The main conclusion, and based on the, the conclusion, uh, uh, we are going to recommend following implicate, follow, follow policy implications. First of all, excuse me, excuse me, Abdusana, you have one minute left. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, it's the last slide. Thank you. And uh, uh, so the policy implication that I'm gonna say, we show that uh, uh, the results show that. Uh, uh, the caring opinion of uh, other farmers and uh, relatives uh, are uh, related with sustainable agriculture practice adoption, adoption decisions. Therefore, uh, we uh, recommend that agriculture sustainability policies will benefit from integrating information for improving local image and status of farmers who adopt sustainable agriculture practices, uh, as well as information source also main factors. Therefore, the government should pay more attention in improving information about sustainable agriculture practice among farmers, uh, as well as uh, 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 analysis show that land tenure security also main uh, factor. Therefore, the regulated environment which promotes uh, land tenure security and farmers, uh, the autonomous decision making, particularly farmers own adoption decision can facilitate SH adoption. And uh, lastly, uh, the government uh, uh, should also promote cooperation among farmers because our results show that participating cooperation in crop production uh, is significantly related with uh, uh, adoption decision. This is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, welcome, thanks.
Thank you very much, Abdul Samir, for this interesting presentation with uh, empirical findings. Uh, and also, uh, thank you very much uh, that you could finish exactly on time. Uh -huh. So now I am opening the floor uh, for the QA section part. So you have you have two questions, right? Uh, yes. I have. Two questions. So from first question from Zafar Kurbanov, mm -hmm. and uh, I think Zafar, are you online? Hello. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Can you ask your question directly to Abdul Abdu Um yeah, Yes. So the question is, uh, so we know that in Uzbekistan, we only produce cotton, especially in those two districts, which are not Jomboy. And Jomboy is more specialized in vegetable and fruit production. So uh, my question would be, uh, monoculture would limit in Uzbekistan the farmer's potential to diversify, I mean, to adopt the sustainable practices. So do you have, have you looked at this, like the district level differences in adoption SAP so maybe John boy has more farmers who adopt because they have freedom to crop more crops uh, okay thank you Zafar if I understand your question about the district differences so actually for the reason of uh, time limiting uh, I didn't show the uh, district actually we can consider the district uh, uh, effects of uh, adoption decisions so uh here the slides you may see that uh, uh john boy uh, uh, yeah you are right that john boy uh, is uh, 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 not cotton cultivating districts comparing to other districts in the pirate and pastor one and uh, therefore john boy district is a uh, reference group in our case and so the uh, analysis show that uh, uh, so uh, Pasargon and uh, other two districts is, is less likely to adopt sustainable culture practice comparing to Jomboy districts because uh, in the uh, Payar Pasargon produce more cotton and uh, uh, during the uh, survey time, uh, cotton was a uh, main state crops and therefore uh, I mean, there were not, uh, the farmers have not a free decision to uh, cultivate crops or to uh, to use uh, sustainable agriculture practice uh, yeah and, and uh, the also results show that uh, uh, John boy farmers are more likely to adopt sustainable agriculture practice yeah thank you Abdul Samir, uh, for your response and mm -hmm. next question from Sultanat Mambetawa so Sultanat please ask your question if you are uh, online I mean, you can read uh, if you are writing. Well, I can also read. Yeah, I can yeah. read out to you. Farmers mm -hmm. with higher education in Uzbekistan is uh, is related to agricultural education or any higher education. Can you please clarify it? Uh -huh. Okay. It? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Sultanat uh, Mambetova, for your question. Yeah. In our case, higher education means, uh, uh, if I clarify, so just a minute. Uh, 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 one moment. Uh, in our case, education is a dummy variable. Dummy means uh, one means if farmers have higher education, if they uh, studied in institute or university, not uh, kind of colleges or academic museum, not only higher education, higher universities, uh, they are more likely to adopt sustainable practice in case of Uzbekistan. And hope I answered the question. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Abdul Samir. Now I have also uh, one question uh, uh -huh. clarification. So uh, I would like to clarify one point on page six. Uh, can you go mm -hmm. back to page yes, six? Yes, yes. Page six, so, uh, conceptual, yeah, framework. conceptual framework. Yeah, I want to ask uh, mm -hmm. about your conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, this is very good uh, uh, to mm -hmm. have such conceptual framework, uh, which can explain what factors influence farmers' decision to adopt uh, adopt sustainable farming practices, right? That's so about the practice, uh -huh. it's very good because uh, you are you uh, you learned uh, from your literature review that these factors are important uh -huh. before analyzing your uh, finding. So and then on page six, 10, if you go to slide page 10, 10, Yes, yes. Uh, uh, you, show, uh, you show us 
descriptive statistics on those factors between adopted and non-adopted farmers. Uh, so it's very good to link the, your theoretical base with descriptive statistics and empirical work because you want to test your theory with your data, yes, with your own data and see uh, how it's uh, work in real life. But uh -huh. however, I can find all these important factors in descriptive statistics. So it would be nice if you could give uh, names so that we can understand which variable belongs to which factor. Uh, so okay, age, okay. farm, farm size, it's what? Which factor? Uh, okay, okay, and I see. Uh -huh. in, yeah, yeah, that's just uh, technical yeah, issue. Yeah, yes, yes, uh, thank you for your comment. Yeah, yeah, it should be good, but uh, the, it was very, how can I say, uh, take more places here for, uh, and also therefore I decided to show um, some select variables. Yeah. Okay, I will consider, yeah, thank, thanks. Yeah, yeah, because you are not using, uh, uh, you are taking all these variables from theoretical framework and you, are, yeah. you want to see uh, what is changing, what's not changing. Ah, okay, uh, okay. Uh -huh. Output of the variables, right? I see. Uh, yeah. two, two groups, it's an adopted mm -hmm. and unadopted groups. And okay. then you'll go to your findings, right? You'll analyze them. Mm -hmm. But you yes. also use with all these uh, yeah. variables in your uh, finding, right? Mm -hmm. so the second yes. question is uh, that uh, could we briefly explain why this methodology is most suitable one? Yes, yes of course, we know that logic models are one of the most popular models when you uh, want to analyze. Uh, you mean this one, yeah? not. Yes, but, uh, yeah. but uh, maybe there is another, other, another model which can uh, work better than logic model. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah so, uh, thank you, uh, Patrick. Actually, we are the, uh, this is a, uh, one of part of um, our research, and in the second uh, part, we are going to this also impact analyze how the impact of just, uh, adoption of sustainable practice on farm performance. Farm performance can be uh, uh, income or um, yeah or crop yield, and can be. Uh, and most studies used in the fourth stage uh, the simple profit model. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, and also all model, most uh, variables are also dummy variable and the uh, dependent variable also dummy variable. And therefore, we decided to uh, profit more model. And in the second stage, we are going to use uh, some another point for impact analysis. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about using multinomial logic? Ah, multinomial. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah, multinomial logic. Yes, but uh, actually I tested to multi no, uh, no, yeah, model also, but I haven't seen much differences. But if I uh, measure sepa uh, separately uh, lay or to uh, or using multi no, no, no measure also. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the result is not so many differences, so therefore I decided to use separately. So by by using this logic or this profit model, you are, you are, you have uh, separate uh, findings, separate analysis for each of this uh, this uh, technology, right? Uh huh. Conversation theology right? and test control methods. But when you use this multinomial logic, you have only one analysis, one finding for all three categories. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. If I uh, when we use uh, when I use uh, multinomial model. Uh, the results show that separately, yeah, actually. In the multi multinomial model, I think, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, 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 yes, you are running out okay. of our time. That's why, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to finish on this point. Uh, so, thank you very much thank you. for this That's... interesting, uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, now uh, I, I will ask. Uh, second presenter to give his speech. Yeah. So uh, first, first of all, I would like to introduce our second speaker. Uh, uh, so now we are pleased to welcome Christian Kelly Scott. Uh, is it right? Uh, yep. It's correct, right? So, yep. So uh, he is a dual doctoral PhD candidate in rural sociology and international agriculture, development in Department of Agriculture Economics, and Sociology, and Education at the Pennsylvania State University. So his research focuses on social issues of hunger and food insecurity. Uh, his dissertation focuses on the economic, environmental, and social determinants 
of household food security in the rural south, southern Kyrgyz highlands. So he will he will present on the topic uh, today uh, the pasture, the village, and the and the people, food security and dominance and abatements in the southern Kyrgyz highlands. And uh, you have 20 minutes for your presentation and 10 minutes for discussion. So I will remind you when you have five minutes and one minute left. So the floor is yours, yours, Christian. Christian. Now you can start your presentation. Thank you, Kenderbeck. I appreciate it. And uh, well done, Abdi Sami. I think there's a little bit of time. I'd like to ask him a quick question at the end too. Uh, this is a great, great talk. So thank you all for being here. Um, is the sound working okay? Everyone can hear me and everything? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Christian Scott. Uh, I am a dual doctoral candidate at Pennsylvania State University. Um, and I'm presenting part of the work here today that was conducted for my, uh, my dissertation research, um, which was conducted in part uh, in 2017, and then my, a lot of my field work was conducted um, last year in 2019, uh, specifically focusing on Southern Kyrgyzstan. Um, so, so, so why does this study focus on Kyrgyzstan? Well, this study focuses on uh, you know, all of Alai Rayon, but specifically what I'm presenting here today focuses is in, on a, a small, uh, a small village or municipality located in the Gulcha River Valley in the south. Um, the larger context of this study was it was looking at places that are undergoing both social and environmental transitions. So obviously the effects of climate change are sometimes felt more profoundly in high elevation communities. Um, but you also have the social and economic changes that are going on in Kyrgyzstan and, and quite frankly in, in rural places and high elevation places all around the world with an increasingly globalized economy um, and a in increasingly uh, interconnected social space that we all are experiencing with every passing year. Um, the, the interesting concept in, in Kyrgyzstan is, is this kind of coming together of livelihood strategies between traditional agro-pastoralism and then obviously the, the prominence of remittances and both international and domestic labor migration. Um, oh, I do have some questions. Um, yes, we can get the presentations out at the end of everything. Um, and certainly do feel free to ask questions during my talk. Um, so this study specifically focuses on, on food security in rural Kyrgyzstan. So, in Kyrgyzstan, as in many places, uh, food insecurity is concentrated among vulnerable and marginalized populations, um, specifically in rural areas where up to two thirds of food insecure households are located within these areas. Um, and this has a, a disproportionate effect then on, on, on vulnerable populations uh, like children, uh, women of childbearing age, um, elderly people. Um, and so this study kind of takes this critical lens and, and focuses in on these unique aspects of food security. So the main research question was how does household food security in the Southern Kyrgyz Highlands collectively determined by the social, environmental and economic aspects of rural life? So then how do you break down the social, environmental and, aspect, and economic aspects of rural life? Well, I chose to focus specifically on labor migration and remittances, aspects of agro pastoralism as it relates to the environment and social networks, which as Kadir Beck talked about with the importance of technology adoption, is also important to accessing um, and behavior change in a number of different arenas. Um, related to food security is certainly agricultural technology adoption, but also um, health, building healthy communities, healthy lifestyles. Um, and as we'll see later, it, it operates in unique ways in the research community. The study's conceptual framework conceptualizes food security kind of in the four pillars of access. So do you have access to healthy and affordable food? Um, can you purchase it? Can you grow it? Is, is it, are you able to uh, get to it if you need to? The availability is the physical proximity and the, the um, 
yeah, you know, the presence of healthy foods and foods that meet a caloric consumption benchmark. Um, is it there? Food utilization, which talks about um, how is food being prepared? How is it being eaten? Yes, we're going to get into that in the next couple of slides. Absolutely. Um, and then sustainability, which kind of looks at this more in a, in a longer term examination of social, environmental, and economic aspects. So you can see here the, the networks, labor migration, and agropastoralism. This study both looks at ways that households cope with food insecurity, but also how they achieve food security. So it's not just looking at food insecurity, but also how are households endowed with the ability um, to, to eat fulfilling diets that are sufficient for their entire household. And as we can see, food takes, takes many different forms beyond just uh, fuel going in. And it also looks at the effects of shocks and, and challenges, what are the barriers to actually achieving food security. So food security can be looked at in a number of different ways. You, know, you can look at these four pillars, stability or resilience in kind of the FAO's definition replaces sustainability in this study's conceptual framework. Um, you can also look at malnourished and undernourished where you have um, other things like stunting and wasting where you have a low height for age for children or a low weight for age for children or you have kind of acute or chronic. So in the short term, are you not getting enough food you know, in the immediate? And in the long term, are you getting enough nutritional content of food over a period of time? And this study looks at all of this through the different lens of the pillars of food security. Um, so the, the food security determinants in the conceptual framework are outlined with the environmental determinants are focused on through the framework of political ecology. This idea that the environment is inextricably linked with the political in this community and in Southern Kyrgyzstan. And it is not easily separated out into a separate form of analysis where this is the environment and these are humans. Rather, they are deeply intertwined through agro-pastoral livelihoods and through um, the very proximity and the movement of people in the village, as we'll see later. Um, the social determinants are looked at through a, a unique aspect of social capital where benefits are endowed into individuals based on their social relationships, and that is then mapped through social networks. And the economic determinants are, are looked at, as we'll see in more detail, through the lens of, of an informal economy, as well as uh, labor migration and this idea of outside funds coming into the community through the form of remittances. Um, so specifically, where was the study? It was conducted in LI, which is in Southern Osh. Um, it's a good picture <laughs> looking out over LI. This is the LI Valley. Um, in 2017, there was a large scale survey um, that took place um, with a, a sample strata um, of villages throughout all of LI, both in the LI Valley and the Gulta River Valley. Um, that included variation based on political representation, population, elevation, and market access with some areas that were ineligible for the sample strata. So with this, I was then able to um, collect what we considered to be a representative sample of a lie. And, and this was more focusing on 1,234 household surveys that in total asked household roster questions for 6,581 individual, over 2,000 children. Um, and then we asked information about migrants that were away. Um, so that the migrants themselves were not included in the sample strata, but rather the origin household answered questions about um, the migrants that were away. And what we see here is uh, specifically the number of interviews that were done in each village, or some of the villages are close together and they, they group together in this image. So what was found primarily relating to household food security and from this larger scale survey is that diets are highly seasonal. Dietary diversity is frequently lacking in fruits and vegetables. Um, there is a low occurrence of acute food insecurity with more issues of chronic issues of food security where you have a heavy dietary reliance on sugary and oily fatty foods. Um, and then it was also found that households experience uh, an improvement in consumption measures following a socioeconomic or an environmental shock, but also a, a decrease 
in food security, they elevated rates in experiential food insecurity. So have you skipped a meal in the past week? Um, do you feed your kids before you feed yourself? These kind of things um, following a shock, which is curious because you would think that following a shock consumption and experience would both suffer. Um, and this kind of spoke in part to the time frame of the question, um, but also very much towards, it seems like maybe these coping strategies are working. And then in the aftermath of a socioeconomic or an environmental shock that, that those different household strategies are successful then in improving diets, at least in the short term. So this required more investigation. So in 2019, I went back for a more longitudinal um, data collection procedure consisting of a, a major survey in the winter and a major survey in the summer at the high point and the low point. Well, maybe I should say in the, in the, in the fall and the spring, um, a, a high point and low point of food insecurity so I could get the comparison between the two time periods. And then in between, through the course of nine months, I was able to conduct in-depth interviews every month um, to kind of get at these issues more in detail. And so today we're gonna to be focusing on, on Kichi Blulu, where these more in-depth interviews took place. Um, so Kichi Blulu is a municipality. It's kind of confusing. It's also the name of a specific village, which is a group of four small hamlets. And it's also a string of six villages, uh, kind of an interchangeable geographic term. Um, so what I was able to do then was to do a population survey of every household that was willing to participate in the winter, which is 157 winter surveys, 157 summer surveys, as well as complete 44 in-depth interviews and conduct detailed field notation all throughout the process. Um, household food security was measured in the surveys by using you know, seven internationally validated uh, measures of household food security. So you have kind of experiential measures, which are the coping strategy index, the household food and security access scale and household hunger scale. You had an economic in indicator, which was the percent expenditure that a household spends on food in, a, in an estimated month. Um, so if they're spending you know, all of their household expenditures on food, that is a negative indicator for household food security. Um, also self-assessed, people said I food insecure all the way down to food, extremely food insecure. They, they were able to rate their own household. And then consumptive, we asked about their diets in the past 24 hours and then in the past um, seven days. So we can see kind of the nutritional balance of foods. Um, so every household was then asked um, to talk about every individual member of their household. So we were able to get, at least get demographic information to profile every member of the household. We asked about remittances, how much is sent back, how is it spent, who makes the decisions around that, what kind of agro-pastoral um, activities is a household actually engaging in. So do you have crops? Do you have livestock? How are you making up um, the foundation of your livelihood? Um, with these household rosters and the, and the large sample size of the survey, I was able to complete um, whole network surveys looking at kinship, labor, and food sharing networks um, that we were then able to look at the relationship between those networks and food security status. Um, and then also more in the qualitative analysis, focusing more on food utilization and how households cope with tough times. Um, so just re real quickly, the, the overview of the village kinship networks um, were found to be much, much more, um, more dense. So they were much closer than the labor sharing or the food sharing networks. Um, and they changed a little bit from the winter to the summer um, as households move out to pasture or they move back and forth to um, Osh, depending on the time of year, whether they go and, and live in a, in, a, in a more urban setting during the more difficult months of winter. Um, and so what, what I have displayed here is the sociograms where the, um, the open dots are a survey respondent household. And then also in the surveys, people named individuals that were not mentioned in the household roster. Um, what do you do with those? <laughs> um, well, it could have been a mistake, could have been mentioning someone that doesn't live in the village, could have been men mentioning someone that declined to participate in the survey. So those were treated differently just with demographic information. It's the term I called the, a cingulate. So you can see here, that those are the nodes that are filled in. Um, those are households that were not included in the wider survey, but are then included in the um, network analysis to complete, maybe make some of these connections that otherwise would have been missing. 
Um, so what that allows is me to look at different measures of food insecurity mapped onto these kinship networks. And so what we have here is a standardized value for experiential food insecurity, rural um, reduced coping strategy index. So what you'll see here is, is the node size, a larger node denotes a household that is more food insecure. They've experienced more food insecurity coping strategies in the last 30 days, skipping a meal, feeding their children first, having to eat food that is less preferred or less expensive. Um, and what I did with those cingulates, excuse me, those individuals that we don't have necessarily all the information about is I just set that to the median value and you, and you can see the comparison. Um, and so what, what you saw here is these focal nodes is there seems to be a clustering, I'm able to demonstrate this quantitatively as well, um, of households that are experiencing food insecurity coping strategies um, that are also grouped together in these kinship groups. So, so the implication here being that kinship groups are, um, tight kinship groups are, are instrumental then to households making it through tough times that if, if a household is experiencing food insecurity, that they are able to reach out to other members within their kinship network. And that's interesting. Um, so talking more about the, the qualitative findings, we kind of narrow down into why is this? What are the different determinants? And so one of the areas of focus was the, the idea of environmental subject making. The idea that I mean, that the individual's identity and their household livelihoods are inseparably linked with the environment and the actual praxis of interacting with the environment. So seasons, the passage of seasons have more to do with, have less to do with just simply having snow on the ground and more to do with the, the flows and the patterns of livelihoods. So the time of pasture is the time of plenty where you have food preservation of wild foods and in foods that are produced being instrumental in informing a household's food security status across different seasons. You also then have a focus on what I, I deem in the, in the paper to be moral heritage foods. So we are Kyrgyz, so of course we eat meat. So you have Iran and you have um, Kyrgyz balls there on the right. And you have these foods that are, are linked to the pasture, are linked to the movement of life and linked to the practice of raising livelihood, of, of raising livestock, I should say, sorry. that. Um, that families have practiced for generations. So that is tied not just to um, nutrition, but also tied to the environment and the family history that is involved in these foods. Christine, I'm very sorry, you have five minutes left. Yep, perfect, we're out of time. Um, so what, what I kind of want to focus in these last five minutes are on what I call the village economy. And, and so this is unique to Kichibululu um, I do not make more generalizable statements outside and throughout Alai or Southern Kyrgyzstan here, but this is a unique case study and an interesting aspect. So the economy within Kichibulu is made up of these, these kind of these four unique aspects. So, so you have community assistance, sharing, an insular economic sector, and external economic sector, where you have these, these aspects of, of food sharing and the village economy that are within the village. So you have community assistance, you have sharing, and you have an insular economic worth bartering or um, kind of informal exchanges of food or um, small market uh, food loan credit opportunities that are just within small little bodegas in the village. Um, but you also have this, this underlying, this, this remittances that are coming in from the outside and are, are changing the shape of food security and the village itself. So it's focusing on community assistance. There's two quotes I think that illustrate this pretty well. There is a saying that goes, some neighbors are closer to you than even your close relatives. So people are helping other individuals in the village, not just based on these kinship networks, but also based on proximity and uh, the affinity of neighbors. So we might not have much comfort and in infrastructure like other places, but if you look from the side of human values, I think you can see here more humanity than other places. They are interested in helping others and they are kind. And people really are. This is a unique aspect of the village economy and social relations that relates to household food security and that there's always seemingly a base layer where if a household's in, in, in dire need or in, in, in need, um, irrespective of their social relationships, that the, the community assistance aspect really comes into play in household resilience strategies. 
And then you have sharing, which is, which is distinct here from community assistance. It is not as prefaced on need necessarily. You have households, obviously that relate to, um, to kinship links and you see more household sharing within kinship links, but you also have this, maybe it's tied to the nomadic history, maybe, maybe it's tied to the cultural norms within the village. You have a, a sharing of food that takes place, especially among these moral heritage foods that is not prefaced on need, that is simply prefaced on proximity. And uh, maybe if it's, especially if it's a visitor, um, it is a, a sh an expression of goodwill that is uh, operationalized through food. Um, and then you have the insular economic section. So here you have in recent years, in the last three years, people have started practicing bartering. They bring flour and onion by car and exchange them for berries. It is a laborious, laborious job to collect berries. They ripen in the September sun. In September, when the berries ripen, they are collected. We exchange them for flour, one pail of berries for one sack of flour. And so this is key in ensuring dietary diversity within the village where you have maybe the road gets washed out and you have a completely insular economic sector where you no longer have access to external markets for food within the village, households exchange food, labor, whatever it is in this insular environment um, and it enhances diets and increases dietary diversity. Um, and so that, that's kind of the overview. So we, we talk about what are the determinants? Well, we focus on labor migration and this external money that's coming in that impacts household food security. You have the social with the intergenerational ties to livelihoods and agro-pastoralism, the, the leaning on kinship networks for coping with difficult times. Um, and you also have the, the seasonal aspects, which, which talk about um, the passage of seasons, not just in snow on the ground, but also in the timing of community celebrations in, in when you physically move your household out to pasture where um, elderly individuals may take grandchildren and, and, and where people are is then an expression of their livelihoods that is reflected in the foods that they eat. Um, so the wider significance and contribution of this study is, is hopefully to inform policy relating to climate change resilience, traditional knowledge preservation and rural development initiatives. The mixed method approach allows for a depth of analysis that I think has has a profound local relevance, but also wider implications for the discussion of vulnerable and underserved populations in rural areas, focusing on high mountain communities and food insecurity. Um, and so I would be remiss then at the end of my conclusion that I don't thank my collaborating partners, as well as the amazing research team here that here they are in 2017 on the right, um, that helped us collect all the surveys and worked very, very hard to make all of this happen. And, and also my wife here on the left, um, who is very supportive in all of my research. And uh, I have to give her a, a thank you at the end of the talk here, certainly. Um, so thank you all. I look forward to hearing questions um, and having a, a lively discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, I really Thanks. appreciate it. I really appreciate that you did your own field research, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, you also did uh, this field research not only in summer but also in the winter period, right? And in yeah, in between you also did some interviews, yeah, with households. And, and but by doing this field research, I think you could observe many things from a distance, from a close distance, with households and understand how they behave in a social environment. And how they yeah, re react, yeah, how they cope, yeah, how they cope with uh, with shocks, right? Mm -hmm. And or how yep. they re re how they uh, deal with these shocks and how they react to situations around them. So now I am opening the floor to QA section, to discussion part. First, let me check QA function. So there is only one question, and let me read out. Uh, oh, before there was one question and I was answered. Uh, yeah. There was one question before. Uh, yes, uh, uh, it, the question was about uh, about uh, the measurement of uh, measurement of your output variable, uh, uh, food security. How did you calculate and how did you measure it? And second question about your statement, 
where did you take uh, or how uh, the about this you know the two third of population lives under um, uh, under uh, can you open the the first page for the second slide sure um. Three was a citation to next, maybe. Here? Ah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, the question was about the second statement. Uh, to, big... to sort of, yes? Uh, yeah, you may still see the question. I, I, I may read. How do you define food security, the FAO definition, and how do you measure it? Yes, sure. thank you. What is yeah, the source it's... of your statement that uh, two, three of the rural population in Kyrgyzstan is vulnerable to food security. This question. Yeah, this is a question. Yeah. And I, I believe that's taken from the FAO um, stat. FAO stat. Um, I have the citation for it. I just don't have it on the specific thing. It's difficult with uh the temporal variation it depends on when you look so i went with a a, a large number <laughs> two-thirds um it's yeah so estimates between 60 and 70 percent of food insecure households um are within rural areas and so that's an fao statistic um i also draw from unicef and world food program data um that's the the first half of my not the first half. So the first empirical chapter of my dissertation talks about wider national food security trends. Um, and so, yeah, that's using secondary data sets. Um, so that's kind of what this is talking about is, is the, the wider context in the nation. Um, so yeah, so FAO. Um, and then specific in, the, in this study, how is it measured? Um, so the empirical measurements then are these are these seven um the coping strategy index food consumption score household dietary diversity score yeah that's if that makes sense okay and uh and uh, i think there is also another question uh Adoira, from uh, from Adoira. Uh, are you online Adoira? can you ask <laughs> yes that's andre can you hear me Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question was, um, I wrote it in the chat, but I can just read it aloud for the other participants. Um, is this mutual support at the local level, a strategy developed by grassroots efforts or based on historical knowledge traditions, or is it an instrument introduced by external actors? Because um, what I observed in the Pamirs of Tajikistan, where you have an instrument called Ambari, it's a kind of um, storehouses for cereals, grains which was introduced uh, by external actors, especially here in this case, the Mountain Society's Development Support Program of the Aga, Aga Khan Development Net Network. Um, yeah, exactly, this is the point. Is this really a, a local specific thing or is it an idea which was introduced by external actors? Sure, so in this community, th there's both. So there is an Aga Khan, um, a shared, um, a, a, an Agahan development presence um, where there is a shared community center for with emergency food reserves. But I think specifically what I'm talking about in this analysis is the, I don't want to say informal because it's formalized in the social norms, um, but it is not, in, it is not um, originating from a grassroots effort based on, or, sorry, a local level strategy developed by an external group. It is very much prefaced on historical knowledge and traditions. Um, the community assistance aspect, um, that's and it's something I didn't get to talk about, which is actually really interesting. You have, so what's a good in, example of this? Um, so following the collapse, there, was, um, there were yaks that were owned collectively um, in this area. And following the collapse, when a lot of assets were, were privatized, the yaks in this community were kept under collective ownership. And the community yak herd has grown. Um, and what it has done is, and this is a perfect example of the community assistance, um, is it's used as a resilience strategy. So if a household has their house burned down, if there's a landslide and it takes down a house, 
Um, maybe a yak will be sold for meat. Maybe some of the, um, the dairy or the, I mean, it's more difficult the dairy or the meat to kind of slaughter these animals out in pasture. If they're close, it's more feasible. Um, and, and so though, then the proceeds of that yak or those couple of yaks that are sold that are just freely given to the household that has experienced the shock. Um, and so throughout the years, this community yak herd has grown and the community's ability to provide assistance in this way has improved since um, national independence and the reorganization of the local economy. Um, and that, that has, it has parallels through if there's, if there's a house that gets taken out with a landslide, I mean, these are extreme examples, maybe uh, a house that was not occupied or a new house is built for um, that very extremely vulnerable household that otherwise simply would not be able to make it um, through that shock, the community then freely provides assistance. Um, and then, so these are big examples, but then the, the small examples are bred are, are these gestures of kindness and affinity that are based on proximity and community relationships um, that have implications for dietary diversity, especially in the winter. If a household is out of pres preservations um, or, yeah, this is specifically for fruits and vegetables, um, then assistance is, is freely given without any expectation of reciprocation. Um, so it is based on historical knowledge um, and, a, and a shared societal norm, I would say, um, at so least in this localized context. But really good Thank question, you. yeah, it's, it's so both. <laughs> Thank you, Christian, for a clear explanation. Uh, now I have one small question. Uh, mm -hmm. You can answer quick, quickly. So uh, I think you observed all that from your field research that almost all villagers always keep at least one cows, one cow to ensure optimal consumption of animal products in the family, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So not only people in villages, but also in big cities, people somehow they try to keep at least one livestock if they have open areas where animals can be kept. So mm -hmm. my question is that, did you observe that people in small villages, not in big cities, in small villages, use their livestock in order to cope with shocks by selling their livestock? Did sure. you see this kind of observations, uh, evidence in your field research? I did. Um, I did so a lot of times, um, this kind of relates to the informal economic sector. Livestock is used as a, um, a form of asset accumulation and a way to manage risk because livestock is so well suited for these areas um, and is able to thrive and, and, uh, and reproduce and create these products that a lot of times households will use livestock as a, a major place to store um, their assets. So a lot of remittances that are sent in are used then to purchase livestock or um, assets that maybe don't depreciate, but rather appreciate. Um, so yes, livestock is certainly used for a coping strategy in the aftermath of an environmental or a socioeconomic shock. I think where this really comes into play is at the, is at the lower end. At, mm. And that's what you were talking about with the individuals using livestock. Almost everyone has some livestock that they use to ensure a base level of consumption, especially year round, because livestock are back in the village in the winter. And so dairy consumption goes up in the winter because they're close by. Um, and so what's really important here is is the vulnerable households that have to make a, dis a decision, and I, I don't necessarily have a, an answer for this, is then to slaughter or sell that livestock when you don't have a lot. So in the aftermath of a shock is, is, a, is a really important decision because it, it limits both a productive asset for your household to have food in these difficult times, um, but it also gives you that cash infusion that you might need in the short term. So it, it's so both, it, it is used as a coping strategy but some households, especially on the very lower end, are reticent to use it as a coping strategy because of what it represents on uh, a wider household economic scale. So if you if you can only um, if you can only afford uh, a set amount of money to send a migrant away, sometimes you have to sell that livestock. So so there's kind of a sunk cost initially in these shocks or immediate decisions. Uh, in a hope that it may pay pay off further down the line. Um, that's a good question. 
kind of all of the above. It's difficult to answer, you know. Thank you, Christine, mm -hmm. uh, for, Thanks. for your answers. So they were very clear for us and insightful. So I appreciate and uh, I wish all the best to you since you, Thank are, you. you are running out of our time. So I want to mm -hmm. end at this point. And now I will ask the third uh, presenters to present his uh, their presentation or her presentation. So let me introduce uh, our third pre presenter. Mm. So here. now I will. Uh, so you are pleased. You are pleased to uh, to welcome Maria Yamshikova. Are you here? Yes. I, you can yeah. see your. You can see. You can see your face. Good. So uh, uh, she will be presenting today on the topic uh, gathering evidence and supporting multi-stakeholder engagement on the role of diets and food systems in the prevention of obesity and non-communicable disease, disease in Kyrgyzstan. She is a junior research fellow at the Institute of Public Policy and Administration at the University of Central Asia. She holds bachelor's degree in economics from the American University in Central Asia. Her research uh, field includes not only socioeconomic development, but also food security uh, and uh, nutrition, gender studies, public, public policy, and development economics. So within 2019 and 2020, uh, she, uh, she co authored four research uh, reports and authored one paper uh, on the topic, the role of women in the economic development of Afghanistan. So you have 20 minutes for your presentation and 10 minutes for QA. So I will remind you when you have five minutes and one minute left. So the floor is yours, uh, Maria. Now you can start your presentation. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everyone. Today I will present some research findings on food dietary patterns and non-communicable diseases development in the Kyrgyz Republic. I would like to present our uh, research team members, Kanati Likeyev, Michael Lona, Roman Magilevsky, Kanakea Sanaliev, Azalina Nikeyev, and Baymat Nizaliev. So here is the outline of my presentation. First of all, I would like to briefly introduce and present their <clears throat> project study purpose and tasks. Then some preliminary facts of situation with health and nutrition outcomes. Then health outcomes, non-communicable diseases and linkage with nutrition practices and conclusions. So uh, these findings that I'm going to present as a part of our project funded by FAO on gathering evidence and supporting multi-stakeholder engagement on the role of diets and food systems in the prevention of obesity and non-communicable diseases in Kyrgyzstan. And the main research uh, components of this project are infant and young children health and nutrition. We used mixed data for this. Then uh, food consumption, we used KHS data for the detailed approach of food consumption of the households. Food systems, um, the analysis of food systems on cave foods, but this part will not, is not included in this presentation. Yet, uh, then health outcomes, some data uh, on non-communicable disease in Kyrgyzstan. And at the end, some facts and interlinkages of two topics on food consumption and health outcomes. And um, also our uh, research is supplemented with policy analysis of the main and relevant fields. Also with a historical overview, brief historical overview of the Kyrgyz diet. And uh, our analysis of food consumption and food practices is supported with primary <clears throat> data, sorry, primary data collected in five oblasts of Kyrgyzstan. And uh, we also try to include uh, COVID shocks, how it is related to the food consumed, but all this information will be included in the final report, not in this presentation yet. So, um, right. 
Um, I would like to start from our estimations of mixed data on nutrition status of uh, children under five years old. So uh, we can see here is that basically all forms of malnutrition, stunting, wasting, underweight, overweight, and obesity has a um, declining trend from 2006 till 2018. And Stunting basically has the most um, declining trend among all the other forms of malnutrition. Um, to compare with uh, um, trends of in nutrition status for adults, we used KHS data to produce BMI index. And here we can see that uh, the proportion of adults with underweight and normal weight is decreasing over the time from 2012 till 2018. However, the proportion of adults with overweight and obesity increased almost on 5% from 2012 till 2018. Then, um, here are the trends in infant and young children feeding practices. We, can, uh, we observed upward trend of a proportion of children under six months that currently breastfeed it. Uh, so basically it, there were 32% of children in 2006 and it increased to 51% in 2018. In uh, this trend is respected for uh, both genders, for males and females, we observed increasing trend as well for both locations, urban and rural locations. And uh, Jalabat Oblast recorded the highest proportion of currently breastfed children in 2006, while Talas is the lowest. In 2018, Batken Oblast recorded the highest proportion of currently breastfed children, while Bishkek City and Chu recorded the lowest. Um, when we are estimating the minimum dietary diversity cutoff for children under two years old, we also observed the increasing trend from 2014 till 2018. Uh, this is also respected for both genders, for males and females, for urban and rural areas, and for all quantiles, wealth quantiles. Also, um, for, for Russian, household, Russian households in 2014 recorded the highest number of children meeting minimum dietary diversity cutoff, while Uzbeks the lowest. And uh, for both ethnicities, the, the, this cutoff, uh, in, the proportion of children increased, but still for Uzbek, it stays the lowest among other ethnicities presented here. Okay, going further, uh, we used KHS data to estimate the food consumption uh, of particular food groups by households. For cereals and grains, we observe the decline trend from 2012 till 2018. Uh, and also uh, we observe that Talas Oblast rural households and households of the highest consumption expenditure quantile consumed more. For roots and tubers, there is also a declining trend and consumption declined by about three grams from uh, its observed period of time. And Isikul and Talas Oblast, as well as rural households and of the highest expenditure quantile reported the highest consumption of roots and tubers. Regarding the meat and meat products, there was an increase in consumption of this food group by about five grams. And also it is interesting that northern uh, households residing in the northern part of the country have the highest consumption comparatively to the south, southern uh, households. Also rural households consumed more comparatively to urban. And for the food group of other animal products such as dairy products, eggs, etc. 
there is also an increasing trend from 2012 to 2018. And Bishkek city, Chu, and Talas Oblast urban households recorded the highest consumption, while Osh, Jalabat, and Narin Oblast the least. For uh, legumes and pulses, their consumption remained low, low over the years, but there is still slight increase in consumption of uh, legumes and pulses. And Chu and Jalabat Oblast and urban households and households of the highest expenditure quantile recorded the highest consumption. For fruit and vegetables, uh, our estimation showed that there was a sharp decline from 2012, while households recorded the consumption of fruits and vegetables, but there was an increase then till 2018. And Chu and Jalabat Oblast, uh, an urban resident, recorded the highest uh, consumption of this food group. For fermented products and processed food, there is no large differences and uh, there are fluctuated quantities and still for fermented product, their uh, proportion of consumption is quite low. And Bishkek and Chuy Oblast and urban households reported the highest consumption of fermented products. For protest food, uh, we didn't observe large differences consumed across oblast, urban rural areas and over the years. And in, it remained between the observed period of time, it remained quietly the same, about 170 grams per day per capita. And households of the highest expenditure quantile records the highest consumption of processed food. For sugar, food, and drinks, uh, consumption remained marginally the same uh, across the years. And northern regions and urban residents consumed more. For tea and coffee as well, the consumption remained marginally the same. Chu and Tisikul Oblast uh, reported highest consumption, while Osh City and Ob Osh Oblast the least. Also, almost all um, food groups are consumed more by, high, uh, by households of the highest expenditure quantiles. Um, then we estimated total daily, daily calorie consumption per capita. And we observed that between 2012 and 2018, there was a decline in their calorie intake from uh, 2,800 till 2,400 calories per day per capita. And OSH uh, Oblast records the least calorie intake, while Talas Oblast records the highest calorie intake. And also, um, this, uh, this declining trend is respect both for urban and rural areas and for the highest and lowest wealth quantiles. Then we examine contribution of each food group to total daily, daily calorie consumption per capita. On the uh, left graph pie chart, you can see the average uh, contribution of each food group between 2012 and 2018. While on the right graph bars, you can see uh, the like, trends of in uh, contribution of each food group. And, um, we observed that cereals and grains uh, accounted their, basically their highest proportion of calorie intake, of daily calorie intake, but there was a decline of their, of their contribution to the daily calorie intake. For roots and tubers, there, is, there was also a decrease in uh, contribution for meat and pre meat products, there was a slight increase. And for fruits and vegetables, there is a decrease since we, uh, as I presented earlier, there was a sharp uh, decline after 2012. This is how uh, households reported. So between 2012 and 2018, 
in general, there was a decrease in the contribution of fruits and vegetables to total daily calorie consumption. Then Maria, we, yes. Maria, I'm, I'm very sorry for this interruption. You have five minutes left. Okay. Uh, then we examine non-communicable diseases. Uh, so basically, we observe uh, some, some decline or stagnant trend of cancer and fire strokes and digestive system diseases for and some increase for hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and stenocardia. Uh, but going further, we disaggregate this um, data between northern and southern regions, and it shows a quite a little bit different trends for northern population and southern, especially for obesity. We observe that for northern regions there is an increase in trend. For um, gallstone diseases, there is also a different trend. I will um, talk about this further. So, um, disaggregating food groups consumption between north and south, uh, south, we also can observe that uh, northern uh, households residing in the northern part of the country consume more meat and meat products, processed food, sugary food and drinks, while uh, southern households consume more fruits and vegetables. And this might be some casualty here if we also disaggregate uh, non-communicable diseases between these regions, we observe that northern households have uh, high trends of stenocardia, obesity, infarction, and also for diabetes and cancer. This is also food for thoughts. So uh, to conclude, uh, food security uh, improved in the observed period of time, so more food is available for the households. However, over time, diet changes. Uh, households become to uh, consume less cereals and roots and tubers, while uh, the consumption of meat and other animal products increased. And uh, we observed that food become not, is not healthy and need to be changed. So the diet is not healthy and balanced. And also some regional disparities between northern and southern regions of the countries of the country is also visible. And uh, non-communicable diseases increased over time and might be caused by unhealthy and unbalanced diet. And also regional differences between non-communicable diseases and diets need to be explored further. So uh, there is more work to be done further and we need to finalize to compile all our research all together and we will do more research and more work on this and we'll produce a final report. Iskela Zetsi, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Maria, uh, for this nice, uh, nice uh, presentation uh, with many instructive graphs and figures and descriptive statistics, statistics of Kyrgyz integrate, integrated household survey data. So using descriptive statistics is very important to understand uh, the data better. Uh, and also descriptive statistics supports uh, your idea before doing any model, right? So from this pers perspective, you did very great job. So not only you, but also your team. Uh, so uh, I, want to, I want to check um, the QA section. Uh, there is one question from Aipere Otuncheva. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Could you please elaborate on South, South, North, disparities you mentioned in the conclusion. So she's asking uh, the question from, from your conclusion part. So can you open first your conclusion? Yes, um, basically the, uh, here I just concluded that uh, as I presented previously the graphs, 
Sorry, I see here. Do you see my screen, my presentation? Yes. So basically, um, this is the conclusion of what I presented here, that there are disparities between North and South, between the food groups consumed and also uh, the rates of non-communicable diseases between North and South. Okay, thank you uh, for this clear explanation. Uh, Sorry, can I interrupt? Yes. Hello? Uh, yes, Ipari, yes. yes. Do you want? Yes, please. <clears throat> Maria, these are the findings of your research or uh, is it uh, uh, taken from another study? No, these are uh, findings of our research. So we did this um, analysis on food consumption and then uh, we analyzed data on non-communicable diseases and we saw these disparities between North and South. So yes, yeah, this is our conclusion, not taken from us. And uh, uh, did you also do uh, uh, analysis on uh, uh, what kind of uh, food types are consumed more uh, in the South and in the North of, of the country? Um, yes, we did this uh, here. We didn't summarize this in graph, but uh, as I presented here by food groups, there were, for instance, meat and meat products consumed more on North part of the country. And also, uh, sorry, here, I think, yes. Uh, meat and meat products consumed more of in, no, by northern households, also sugary foods and drinks, while fruits and vegetables consumed more by southern households, households residing in the southern part of the country. Also, um, processed food is also consumed more by northern. Very countries. interesting findings. Uh, will these data be available uh, for, um, for use and for the citation, of course? Um, yeah, basically this is now work in progress. So at the end, we will produce a final report that we will, um, yeah, we plan to uh, translate it into English. Yes, it is in English, but we will translate it in Russian and maybe Kyrgyz. And as a part of the um, report, it could be uh, posted and shared. Uh, can I also add something? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. Yes, my name is Hannah Telekev. I'm also uh, one of the team members uh, working on this research. <clears throat> uh, we uh, plan to organize at the end of November event uh, dedicated to the presentation of the final results. Uh, it will be slightly, actually it will be uh, more extended, we will pro uh, provide some more information about food systems, about policy part, uh, describing the uh, policies uh, in Kyrgyzstan re related to the food security, nutrition, and also non-communicable diseases. I mean, occurrence uh, and waste. Uh, on the final stage, uh, approximately, we plan to finish it in one month, and the report we uh, will be published maybe. I, we hope it will be published maybe end or beginning of the next year. It will be a one big report explaining all uh, findings we uh, shared today and also some uh, additional parts. Uh, but also we, as Maria said, we will produce some uh, policy briefs and uh, distribution materials on several languages. We, it's definitely needed to provide information not only to the researchers, but, but also to the policy <laughs> makers and also to wider audience. Thanks a lot for attention. Thank you very much, Hanat, for, uh, for your extra information on this question. So uh, uh, I have also several questions to ask, if you don't mind. <laughs> so uh, the first question is, the uh, Kyrgyz Integrated Household Survey from 2006 to 2018. And what was the reason to start from the year 2006? It's my first question. Uh, can you write? Yeah. 
And then second question is that uh, Talas Oblast has more food, more food consumption per capita in, term, in terms of cereals and grains. Do you have any explanation for that? It's my second question. And then third question is that on page 16, you, you are trying to show the gap in health outcomes between Northern and so Southern Kyrgyzstan by using two graphs. However, the y-axis on two figures are not the same. And, uh, and it's, it is diff very difficult to compare to these two graphs, two figures. Uh, this is my third question. And fourth question is on the page 18, where we want to show the case of stenal cardio, cardio and, and, uh, and other disease. I think it's infarction. Yes, and so on. So these cases are per 100,000 people. Yeah. But uh, as uh, uh, but uh, uh, as I know, uh, we have only 5,000 households in Kyrgyz Integrated Household Survey, right? Or, or maybe 12,000 individual. If you if you focus on individual, uh, uh, in, on individuals. So so uh, the question is that uh, how did you take this uh, number, or did you multiply by? some value and in order to calculate per 1000 people. I don't know, I will be happy if you could explain this. And in conclusion, uh, I argue that there is a causality, uh, you argue, yes, in your conclusion, there is a causality. So unhealthy diet uh, affects on, on NCDs, right? NCDs, so maybe it is too early to say about this at this point. Uh, because it's just descriptive statistics and it will just support your idea, but, uh, but in order to show the, uh, the correlation or causation causality, you need to use uh, other models uh, uh, that it's exempt uh, to, to uh, solve the endogenity problem. So I think uh, at this point, it's too early to say about, uh, about the causality. Uh, even your descriptive statistics show shows this evidence. So that's all from my side, and I will, I will be happy if you could answer. Um, yes, I can answer, but if you will allow me not to answer in the order, like you ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's up to you. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to comment on this um, data on non-communicable diseases. We took this data per uh, 100,000 uh, people, but this data is from National Statistical Committee and Ministry of Health. It's not KHS data. We use KHS data for the food consumption analysis. So um, on this graph, also thank you for your comments. That's why, yes, um, there's too many like um, numbers and they're all different. That's why we indicated number at the beginning and the end to make it a bit more clear. For um, regarding KHS data, yes, we didn't take their earlier waves because um, the, um, the diary um, on food consumption, that household field, they are different for the previous years uh, till 2011. And then from 2012, they changed uh, their like, um, they change a little bit the list of products and so on. So to be more like um, in line with the research we took from 2012 and further. Mm -hmm. Then, um, yeah, maybe on uh, regarding t consumption of food products in Talas, maybe Kanat can support with this. <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, in reality, it's not only uh, related to the cereals and grains. It also uh, higher consumption of, for example, for meat uh, and some other products. Uh, but uh, you read, it might be there are two reasons. First of all, uh, as we know, in uh, Talas area, uh, we uh, see uh, that by the same uh, database cages, uh, data. Uh, demonstrate very uh, significant uh, decline of the poverty trends. And it's actually 
simultaneously happening. So it means we can say that people start to consume more and they start to consume more uh, nutritious foods, which is typical for curry. So it's a, there's a lot of noodles, there's a lot of bread, and they start to increase uh, to consume more meat. And uh, there, this, this may be one explanation. Another explanation might be that, as we know, uh, even uh, we have on database uh, a representative on the national level, on, on the regional level too. But the sample size for the, uh, each uh, province is not really big. Uh, if analyzed, uh, we have approximately 520, 530 households per province but half of them are urban. It means that we have for the rural uh, Talas, uh, in this case Talas province, approximately 260 households only, uh, which might be simply uh, not enough to reflect fully, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, fully the uh, picture of specifically in the region. Uh, and there is also some data, for example, in uh, if we analyze the poverty trends in uh, Osh Oblast, in Osh City, they're also sometimes uh, not always explainable. So that might be also uh, reasons of the uh, not sufficient sample size. So we cannot decide uh, or cannot answer fully on this question. Uh, at the end, um, now, uh, that's why we do not put the, the word that we found causality. Uh, if we look on the last uh, page, this Maria show, that we uh, state that it might be thought. This word is not <laughs> occasional here. Might be is not, we, we do not demonstrate uh, fully uh, explanation that we find a linkage here. But the uh, science, it might be a uh, coincide or uh, different factors could, could also explain the difference between the uh, different uh, NCDs uh, trends in northern and southern Kyrgyzstan. But uh, as we know from theory, uh, different diet brings to different health outcomes. And some diseases are very closely correlated to consumption, for example, of sugar, for example, consumption of red meat, and uh, consumption of uh, uh, such uh, things like uh, grains and cereals are also not really healthy. And if we look on the, on the share of these products, which is not really healthy, we can say that uh, this share is unproportionately big. Our national healthy, uh, our national diet is not really healthy. And potentially we may expect uh, that that will bring to such kind of uh, health outcomes. But further, uh, studies needed there. We, we understand it and it will be one of the, our conclusions that we need to under, analyze this uh, linkage further because uh, it's on the global level proved that if you are what you are eat, that kind of problems you will face, specifically for certain age groups, yes? After the 40 years old, number of diseases, heart attacks, tenacardia, um, extra weight, uh, <laughs> obesity, it, it comes di directly from the diet. And some other, for example, also, it might be coincide, but we cannot explain everything by the food. But some linkage is possible to be done. Not in this research, but in the future. Thanks a lot for your questions. Thanks very much, Khanat uh, and Maria. Uh, for the clarification and for your answer. Uh, so if no one else wishes to say anything, I, I think we can close at this point, general discussion. So thank you very much for all contributions, your attention and discussion. Thank you, Abdul Sameh, Maria, Chris, Christine, and Hanat uh, for your presentation, for your talk, uh, for your insights, uh, for, your, for your effort. So you did a great job and also thank you for participants for your comments. And I would like to take advantage of uh, this opportunity to thank organizers of the LIK conference, especially Damir and Tinman and the University of, uh, in Central Asia and other donors who are supporting us uh, or who are supporting this conference and also collecting the data every year almost so uh, I'm, I really appreciate your work and uh, uh, you are also providing us uh, this data uh, even for free. 
and organizing such a big international conference. So it takes a lot of effort, a lot of job work. Uh, so it's not so easy uh, to organize this kind of event. So I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm deeply grateful. Uh, and again, uh, thank you for your cooperation and all the best and stay healthy.